I'm Robbie, if you don't know me. Um, I work at ShipShape on the shirts if you want it. Um, Lisa's going to be giving our talk tonight. She, works she also has some stickers and stuff. Um, yeah, go for it. <laughs> hey, so yeah, I have already talked to most of you, but I'm Lisa. Um, so the obligatory slide there. Uh, I'm a senior software engineer at Dockyard. Um, I've been doing this kind of stuff for almost 20 years now. So I've seen a lot of uh, a lot of the same problems come back around with different solutions. Um, I have lots of hobbies. I volunteer too much. I love the Muppets. Um, and I like to bring the Muppets to code bases, particularly in test cases, because I think people should uh, show their personality in tests. So, and this is where you can find me on Ashta DC everywhere. If you want to know what Ashta is, talk to me after. Um, so, I love tests. Um, I love tests because I like to refactor. I like to upgrade. I like to make new features without breaking old features. I like to be confident about these things. Um, so I, I actually get excited when people come out with testing talks, and, and I know that's odd, but I really do like tests. Um, the good thing for me is that Ember also really likes tests. Uh, there's lots of great out of the box, you know, generated tests for you when you start up. There's uh, been a lot of new advancements, well, advancements at least in the testing space more recently um, with better helpers and, and more unification of the strategies. Um, so with that, I'm going to uh, go through a little story here. So I, I am a consultant at Dockyard. Um, so I, I have this great client here of Super Rentals. Um, <laughs> We have a contact us page, it's not our primary page. You know, the rentals listing is more important to us, but the contact us page is, is important enough to have this about button, which I, I do think should probably say contact, but it says about. And uh, <laughs> I've written a test to make sure that my about button is always there and always goes to the right place. So um, I feel good when I change things other places that this is gonna, this is gonna work. So I go and I make some changes on the rental listings and my test pass. Um, Contact page looks beautiful, client's happy, everything's great. My about my about button is still there. Um, make some more changes, maybe to the about <laughs> section this time. Here we go again. <laughs> a little freaky, I don't know if I would click on anything with that guy looking at me like that. But, uh, but my test passed, so I'm happy, I'm confident. Um, then uh, we do some more work, like our UXD guys come in and, and re rearrange some stuff, and, uh, and my tests still pass. Um, the about button is still there, technically. <laughs> so um, I, I want these things to be caught. <laughs> I want these things to be caught before clients see them, before uh, any, any, yeah, before UXD people see them, designers see them and get mad. Um, I also, you know, those are cute little like CSS examples, but but visual testing is also um, things that you just don't have tests for can, can be easily caught, things that um, your users notice right away. Uh, like in this scenario here, what we're actually seeing in a diff is, is a Google API key that is no longer working. Um, so this is something that you probably, you would have a test that you are calling the API correctly, but you don't have like a full end to end going around to the Google API because that would slow down your suites. Um, so, I mean, there's some, some interesting ways that you can do that, but what I really want is a visual inspection to be done automatically with all my tests. I don't want to think about it. Um, I want it to include different viewports. I want to not break the mobile viewport when I'm working on the desktop viewport. Uh, I want to include cross-browser testing, and I say this with a grain of salt, because I don't necessarily mean comparing a cross-browsers. What I really mean is that IE continues to look like IE looks. Firefox continues to look like Firefox looks. When I'm doing something in Chrome where I'm developing that I'm not breaking the IE view of something um, accidentally because I never open it. Um, and then, you know, any other errors that I never thought of in the first place, I would like things to automatically catch those too, because, you know, that would be great. Uh, so how do I get it? This is what I was alluding to before. Um, at Dockyard, we have a thing called Dockyard Days. Um, on one, one day a week, basically, we spend doing uh, internal projects, open source projects, uh, professional development, things like that. And so, I spent the last few of my doctorate days working on uh, looking into visual regression testing and different solutions out there. Um, so simply, if you like, don't know the quick one, two, three definition, um, visual regression testing performs a, a UI test uh, by capturing screenshots in a particular state of your UI, 
and comparing them against baseline images of another state of your UI. Um, it can be manual, it can be automated, none of these things matter, it's really those three points. Um, most commonly, you'll see people talking about going across branches, like in a pull request against your master branch, but it also could be your different environments, um, production versus staging. Uh, I had a friend who works at a, one of the bigger federal agencies, and I asked him if they use any regression testing, and he said, no, no, we don't do anything like that. Um, and then I was like a couple sentences later, he's like, well, when we deploy something, we, we take a bunch of screenshots before the deploy and after the deploy to see what happened and what we broke. And I'm like, well, <laughs> you know, that's kind of the same thing. Like you're just doing it the hard way. Um, so a lot of people do it. So to do regression testing, you will need uh, some, something to run tests that can take screenshots, right? There's lots of things out there that can do this at this point. Some sort of diffing tool. Um, and ideally some sort of interface to be able to see the reporting um, that both humans and computers can understand. Um, so if that's all you need, there's tons of headless browsers at this point, it seems like. Uh, there's a gazillion image diff libraries from like image magic on up. Um, so I should just, you know, put something together myself, right? Uh, so if I'm gonna do this, and this is where it gets hooking in those slides, sorry. Uh, make sure you address. Um, Animations and dynamic data, anything that changes immediately uh, is going to break in your screenshots, obviously, because you can't have your little spinning logo. Um, load times for images. If you have images that load in a little later, they're going to come up as a different image representation in your diff. Um, approval workflows. You want to make sure that you have some way that your developers can say, I actually meant to do this change, um, as opposed to the change that is accidental. Um, Capturing a full page versus just a piece of the page, that one's a little easier, so I could do that. Uh, waiting for client-side rendered content. This is kind of big for Ember people. Uh, our pages do not look like anything <laughs> when they first come up. You need to wait for JavaScript and CSS to kick in and, and everything to really be ready to work with. Um, so your tools need to take that into account. Um, screen capture and diffs are performance intensive and time consuming, so you have to also think about that if you start just throwing them into the middle of a test suite, you're gonna bog down your tests um, and therefore productivity. Uh, and it should also integrate with their existing test tools and be easy to work with, right? So, all right, maybe, uh, maybe I won't write it myself. Um, maybe I will go look and see what's out there. So um, what's out there is a bunch of people who decided to do what I just said. <laughs> Every time there was some new tool, there was a combination put together of a project. And a lot of those are, um, most of those are abandoned. Uh, but there, there are a few out there that can, got a little traction. Um, there are specific things, obviously, for a React, for Angular that you know are so into a niche that they don't really uh, lend themselves to flexibility. There are open source solutions, um, which yeah, open source is a double-edged sword, right? Like so, you get to see the code, but that's all you get sometimes. Um, and there are paid services that uh, have recognized this problem and and tried to step in with a solution. Um, so things you should pay attention to is what's important to you in terms of browsers. Do you need a Selenium style kind of cross everything approach that might be brittle and hard to maintain, but really does in theory work? Uh, do you want specific browsers? Um, please don't write for Phantom. That's all I'll say that. <laughs> uh, you should look for something that can deal with the performance hit. So uh, they, this needs to be taken into account up front. But I can't tell you how many solutions I looked at where People said, well, I can take a dip anytime I want. Um, and flexibility into the way you work. So uh, a lot of solutions are config files plus the command line. So that is ultimate flexibility, I suppose. Um, but it also leaves you with a lot of questions on how you should implement something. Um, so then I thought, OK, too much. Let me go look at Percy. There were great talks at EmberConf last year. Percy's awesome. Let me go. Let's, let's do Percy. So I'll do a little talk here on Percy. Um, they do an amazing job of solving workflow and integration problems. Their image generation is done on your on their servers, so you don't have any performance hit on your own. Um, and I'll go into a little more on that in a second. Uh, they are currently supporting Chrome and Firefox for their browsers, uh, and and multiple viewports are simple. Um, the UI is really slick, and it's easy to work with Ember. Uh, so, um, Percy, you can go and sign up for a free trial for two weeks. I would suggest waiting, it's only two weeks, so I would suggest waiting until you're about to do like an Ember upgrade or something like that, where you're actually going to see um, small differences. Um, these are just, yeah, 
it works easily in your CI. And here's a check and a pull request. Um, so essentially how this works, you create a pull request or a woman creates a pull request, um, goes to GitHub. <laughs> GitHub's being watched by something, let's say Travis in this case, uh, that then sets off a build. So the build is, is going to use Ember with its combination of environment variables, right? So in those environment variables, you set up some Percy tokens um, and that will trigger sending off uh, your tests over to Percy, which will then go back to GitHub and say, yes, you passed or no, you didn't. Um, like I said, super easy integration. So you tell the add-on where you want to snag a snapshot, uh, generally within an acceptance test because you have your full CSS there and everything. Um, and it, what they really do is they grab the DOM um, with the rendered CSS and send that all off to their servers at the end. Um, so they're actually regenerating the DOM and then taking a snapshot of it at that point, um, which means it's all really light on your code, uh, which is what I just said there. So yeah, demo sort of. Um, so at the bottom of any time where I have demo, like I, I got like a super rentals repo where you can see the steps that I did if you're interested. Um, I say sort of because it's a two week trial. And so uh, I, I no longer have Percy <laughs> and I extended it with a fake GitHub account to do this presentation, but it's also expired. So um, a demo of screenshots. Um, these are kind of, you know, simplistic, but it, the point is to show you how easy it is to set it up. So you make an organization, blah. Um, and it says, yay, welcome organization, create your first project. So I make a project for super rentals. Um, and then it gives me those tokens that I mentioned. So simple uh, token and yeah, it's expired. So you can see the token. Um, <laughs> then I go into Travis and in the environment variables section, add those to the token and project. Then I say, okay, now I need you to go to uh, GitHub, but you can do these other things. Um, they have an app that you authorize to work with GitHub. You can give it a minimal bit of configuration, like what repo you should watch. And there's a few other things in here. You can add other users who would want to see your, you know, other people in your company or on your code base. Um, you do definitely want to link your project to a repo so that you have the pull request, but it's literally a drop down. Um, reviewing pricing pans, if you care about those things. Um, browsers for users to test. So yeah, Chrome versus Firefox. Uh, so as far as the Ember integration, um, wow, that is small on a big screen. All right, I'll talk you through it. Uh, at this point here, so this is just a, a, another screencast. Um, I have done your standard Ember install, Ember Percy, and waited for Yarn. So this is where we pick up. Uh, yeah, it's moving, right? All right. So you have your environment. JS, um, just add a few things into the test section here, basically defining your breakpoints and giving them a name. Um, and then you can tell it which ones you want to use by default for every test. If you, you can define more than that and use them explicitly for some tests, uh, but by default, that's in your environment. Then uh, here I am in an acceptance test. Sorry, it's small. Um, pulling in the Percy snapshot test helper. And I'm literally just going to copy and paste it into all of these tests because each one of them is a different route of the app. Um, I'm passing in a cert because the way that uh, their add-on is set up, it'll read the QUnit test name from a cert. So you can copy and paste and keep your test names in sync without rewriting the same thing over and over. And then at the very end, I decided that I really wanted to have the menu by itself because a lot of times you have something that's changing up top it will make your diff uh, red all the way down. Um, and so to figure out sometimes those those more core things, you want to have a nice little test view just of that. So I've done that in there. Um, and then you can see just a few files were changed, package JSON, the test file environment. And that is the installation. So that was pretty painless, right? And then uh, here, this top one, Percy demo, I have made a commit to my source code repo, I have changed the class name from Jumbo to Dumbo, and that is not going to make everything look right. Um, but this will let you see the interface in Percy itself. So obvious diffs, very easy to switch between the different viewports. You can drill into a diff, 
see, you know, compare them side by side or on top of each other, which sometimes it's easier to see when you flip back and forth. Check and make sure it's broken in both Firefox and Chrome. <laughs> um, then it's pretty, you could either approve individual changes or you can just go approve all if you know you made something that's gonna, you know, affect every page. You don't go through and approve them individually. Uh, once they're approved, they won't come back up. It'll be part of what Percy considers its baseline for that branch. I believe that's the end of that one. So why would you not use this service? It's so awesome. Um, it's kind of expensive. Uh, if you are working on your own private site or your private company site, maybe you aren't willing to shell out 150 bucks a month um, or more, depending on the size. Uh, for clients, sometimes this isn't a problem. Sometimes it is. I, I mean, I, I do think it's totally worth it, but it is expensive. Um, and, and it's com comparable to other services out there that I looked there. They're not gouging or anything. Um, another thing is, is you are transporting everything to their servers. Uh, some clients are not okay with this or some companies are not okay with this. Uh, you have something, you know, that's proprietary tech. Maybe you don't want it out in the world. Um, so, I mean, I, I have worked with some that refuse to use it for that reason. If it's not a concern for you, go for it. Percy's great. Um, and their response time on their support team has also been excellent when I've dealt with them. Uh, they're great people. Easy to maintain, easy to train your team. So if you do use it, just pay attention because every every combination of viewport and browser is an impression so if you have a test with three viewports and two browsers that's six impressions against your monthly allowance so that can add up real fast so you you want to make sure that you are you know using your tests in a, in a way that's valuable um smoke screens are usually better than testing every permutation of like form validation so okay fine what else is there um I, you know, like any Ember person, I went to Ember Observer next and started looking for things that would work. Um, Ember Visual Test uh, looks look promising. It integrates well in tests. It's local. Got some CI stuff to it. Basically, what they do is uh, there's a, a test helper, another asynchronous test helper, that will take the URL and send it off to a, a node server that's running alongside, um, wait for whatever delay you tell it to wait, and then take a screenshot. Uh, so you can't really set it up with, you know, I click this, I click this, and then I take a screenshot. All you can really do is like a base route. Um, and it also is doing this as an asynchronous helper. So what I was saying about things being slow, uh, this is happening in the middle of your test. Uh, so it can really slow things down. Um, and that even just like playing on super rentals was noticeable. Um, so then I just like this name, um, Blue Apron did this. And so I guess that's why they named it Kimchi. But it was, uh, looked a little more focused on S3 storage and, and reference images and thinking from a larger enterprise solution space. Um, the older Phantom, like I said, I don't like that. Uh, and it hasn't really been updated. Also abandoned Ember CLI visual acceptance. So people have like tried to tackle this is, is the point, um, but there's not a lot uh, of success. So I looked, beyond Ember then, because um, there's a whole world out there. And uh, so I found Backstop.js, um, which is something some people have probably already heard of. It's a pretty active open source project. There's over 100 contributors. It's not something that's going down with one person uh, or two people or one company even. Um, currently works with Chrome, Phantom, or Slimer. <laughs> Uh, and you can write your, your interactions in different scripts. Um, Puppeteer is what I'm comfortable with, but I tried to not use any while I was playing because I don't really want, I, I think that teams shouldn't have to learn another language to write these, um, language-ish. Uh, it has a cool GUI, so the UI checkbox. Um, and there are considerations for source control integration. There's a Docker solution already included in it. Um, they think about CI. so. All of this, of course, is done in open source, so the documentation is eh. Um, so it relies on an one extensive configuration file where you define all of your tests in JSON <laughs> uh, that they call scenarios. And uh, But it does have some good <laughs> some positives. It waits for client-rendered content out of the box well, uh, provides some good scripting capabilities to set yourself up where you want to be if you need to click this button, wait for this thing, do whatever before you take a screenshot. Um, all right, so the next demo, which again, I'm faking, but I did do it earlier today. 
so in this case, I have installed Backstop uh, via NPM, and I'm typing Backstop in it. It's still small. Um, what now? Hold on, I was just trying to see if I could make it bigger, and then I screwed it up. Let me go back. All right, so backstop in it'll generate um, a backstop data folder for you and a sample JSON file that you can use to set up your tests. Um, going to change the name to Super Rentals. I'm leaving some viewports that they do have by default in there for phone and tablet. They have a before script and a ready script, excuse me, um, that by default go into Puppet, where they have just some helper helpers for Puppet, which actually I don't use in here at all. I'm going to make my first test go to localhost 4200, um, and it is the home page. And I'm going to tell it to wait for Ember view class to be there, which means it'll wait for Ember to do all of its loading and, and getting ready. Um, don't even think I put a delay on it. Nope. All right. And so that's it for the home page. I'm going to run backstop test, which will go ahead and do the first round of grabbing those screenshots. And here they are. They are both marked as failures because there's nothing to compare them against. Uh, so the reference image there is blank. And now I'm going to run backstop approve to set these as the approved images. So now I have a reference images. Um, I'm running backstop a test again just to make sure everything worked. And of course, it didn't. And uh, that's because I've got like half an image. So they have a cool little scrubber tool where you can just kind of go across and see what's different between the reference and the test. It's more fun to play with than I found it to be particularly useful. I still think the diff view is probably better, but cute. Um, so anyway, I realized those images, those are what's throwing me off. I really don't care about them, so I'm going to hide them. So I'm setting hide selectors to include um, a data attribute of, that I've decided to call data test backstop hide. And then I'm going to go into the uh, template where that image lives and add that data attribute. And if you look real quick, you can see the password to something I have, which I have since changed. There it is. There it went. <laughs> <laughs> I've changed it. <laughs> um, yeah, so now I will go ahead and run these again with backstop test. And now I'm going to expect it to fail because in my reference image, I have like half of an image. In my reference screenshots, I have half of an image. And in this, I won't have any. So failed as expected. One of them, the image just never loaded, so it was OK. And backstop for proof again. So now those are saved as my reference. Oh, I did it one more time just to make sure it worked. So now, now everything is actually passing. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and add one more. No, sorry, I don't have my look ahead. I'm at this point. I think I just add into Git ignore a few things because um, obviously you you would want to check in your reference images. You don't need to check in your test images. That's kind of uh, against the point. So um, I'm ignoring my test images. I'm ignoring my HTML report that you just saw, and I'm ignoring the CI report that you get uh, when you're running this in CI mode. Then I'm going to make one more test um, by copying this scenario and making a new scenario. And I'm going to go to the About page. And rather than just changing the route, um, I'm going to go to the Click Handler, uh, sorry, Click Selector, and do a Menu About. So what it's going to do, it's going to wait for Menu About to be there, and then it's going to click it, and then it's going to take the screenshot. And you can actually configure it to wait a little bit after it interacts before it does that screenshot as well. But this is kind of super rentals. So obviously, those two fail um, because they're brand new, but they are there. Um, so basic backstop, that's the concept there. Uh, so does this work in Ember? Has somebody already done this? Somebody has to have already done this, right? Um, so there's an Ember CLI backstop, and it is also abandoned. Um, basically, it just lets you set up some configuration and has a few command line, uh, a few command entries, which seem a little odd because it's all command line to begin with. Um, it, you know, it, it got me thinking that maybe there was something that could be done with this, that maybe I should talk to this person or try and like do a little bit more with this add-on because Backstop can read dynamically uh, from a configuration instead of from the JSON file. Like it actually can be required and then run with a config passed into it. And I was thinking, you know, that sounds, that sounds pretty useful. 
Maybe I should start playing around. So I started playing around. Um, where have I gone over this? Uh, so my first naive attempt, this is really naive, um, but if it would have worked, it would have been so awesome for something to be so simple. So I made a couple of just quick, uh, you know, NPM scripts in here that I can run test, approve, and open the report, right? And then uh, in Travis, I said, okay, run them, <laughs> run test. <laughs> And Backstop has awesome error messages. This is what I get. <laughs> no. Uh, Ember wasn't even was running, of course, at this point. So when it tries to take the test, um, 4200 is not responding. Uh, so that, that didn't work. So I need Ember to run. I don't want to rebuild it again. Um, I know that Backstop has a CI reporting that was return zero and non-zero. So it just works like normal exit code. So you can you know, halt your builds. Um, and I also kind of knew uh, and was reminded that Testum can treat custom node processes as launchers. So your browsers are launchers, but you can also just have something, anything run as a launcher. So, okay, here's my naive attempt number two. Um, went ahead and just set a launcher to backstop <laughs> and said, launch backstop. Um, so that doesn't work. Uh, I don't have the screenshot of that, but that also does not work. And that does not work because you're not on the same URL, of course, when, from when you're running localhost to when you're in CI. A um, few other things wouldn't work as well, but that's the first problem. Uh, and so then I thought, well, I'll just, you know, set an environment variable and it will be cool. Well, backstops JSON. JSON doesn't play with anything. Um, there's no, sorry, JSON. Someone was arguing with me earlier. Um, doesn't play with variables. <laughs> So I thought, well, I can manipulate what's going into Ember test. I can like set the build to go with this uh, optional parameter and I can go through. And if I read, you know, way down deep into the code, I can come up with some parameter to pass in and, you know, maybe I'll get it to work. And it, it, it's not, it's not going to work that way. <laughs> so I, I went back to the internet um, and started looking at their projects that are based on uh, Backstop. And this is one of them by Barriott. Um, it's an open source project. It's <laughs> this is what this is what got me an opinionated interface for writing, running, and saving backstop JS tests. It sounds like somebody from Ember wrote it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, goal is to have an approachable testing suite that can be organized to accommodate small and large projects without overwhelming complexity. So okay, yeah, I want I want that. Um, it is small, but it's active still. Um, so basically what it does is it uses nodes module system to break up that giant JSON, JSON file um, and allow you to set just some configuration that you that you would read in like your config URLs um, and splits up your tests into single test files and things like that that would be a lot easier to maintain. Um, so config URLs, some common stuff in your viewports, uh, test files, got a single prefix. And there's also test groups that you can organize your test files inside. Um, and engine scripts, that's basically the before and ready scripts that we saw before. Last demo. Um, this is just a quick how by Variate works. Um, so I've done an NPM install at this point and I'm running by Variate. Would you like to generate examples? Of course I would. And uh, so now create a reference. So this is kind of the step of saying test and approve at the same time. And I picked their example. So their example site runs. Now I said, okay, run a test on that. Uh, they actually have it set up so that it will fail on purpose. And you get the standard backstop report here, um, including the cute little scrubber, which I had to play with, especially in this view. And and we'll go into code. I think I actually bumped up the font this time, so you're welcome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so in the Bivariate folder, uh, there are test scripts. Um, so there's the base URLs. I'm going to change it from their default to my local host. Um, the reference URL is where you want it, where your reference images are stored. If it's the same, then you just set it to null. Uh, some common stuff. There's nothing really I change in here. It's just um, paths mostly, and if you're what engine you're using underneath. Uh, your viewports, so you don't have to keep putting them in every test. And then I'm going to make a new test for my Super Rentals homepage. Um, 
there's a templates folder in here that has uh, an example test file. So you can just copy paste that, which is nice. Um, and you set some variables up at the top, give it a name, give it a route, give it our Ember view ready selector. Uh, I'm not, oh, the hide selectors, right? The data attribute. Um, I'm not passing in selectors, but you could tell it to specifically look at a selector on the page at a time. If you don't, then you just get the full document. Uh, for some reason, I felt compelled to put a delay on there. And yeah, no ready scripts, super basic. Um, and then for the about, same thing. And then I'm gonna copy it from here so that I don't have to retype the five things I typed. Changes to that, oh, and this time I did it by route, just because it's a different way to run the test. Um, but it should work the same way. And then I made a test group called Super Rentals. Um, and again, I'm going to copy and paste that from an existing test group that can. Um, it, you can see clearly how it's pulling in the common and the base URLs and stuff. There's no, there's no magic to it here. Uh, it's just opinions. And so I'm pulling in Super Reynolds Home and Super Reynolds About. And then when I go back into the command line interface, I will have the option to create a reference on Super Reynolds and not just the example stuff down there. And then I run the test just to make sure. And since I've already gone through the process of hiding that one image, everything is fine. There it is. Um, so another way, um, <clears throat> the more I looked at this, the more I realized, is that really it? Okay. The more I looked at this, the more I realized that um, I was going off course. <laughs> this was a cute little tool and it was kind of inspiring to see how they were breaking it up, but it wasn't getting me where I wanted to go. Um, so the CI usage, although it's clearly written to handle cases of CI, it is not really apparent in any of their documentation um, or examples. Um, and it, yeah, like I said, it was probably best left as a source of inspiration at this point. Um, it is a pretty small project. So then I kept coming back to this dynamic configuration and backstop. Um, basically, this is how they say it should work. You can pull in a, a JavaScript file and have return uh, export an uh, object, or you can pass the object in directly. Um, so what's next from here? Uh, in my dream world, um, backstop is at the core and the inspirations are coming from the other two. Uh, the basic user is able to just pull in a straight test helper like Percy Snapshot with, you know, it's just gonna grab what it's got at the moment and take a snapshot or some sort of snapshot. The advanced user should be able to write scenario files and full scripting. Um, at the end of the test suite, uh, Backstop would run with a dynamic configuration being passed in um, with inspiration from things that already hook into the end of the test suite. In a bonus, um, the GUI would have an approve button instead of me going back and forth and looking at a GUI and then going back to the command line. I mean, we're all used to that, but it's kind of annoying. Uh, requirement passing, regret, required passing uh, regression test for CI to complete. That's kind of built in out of the box um, just by using backstop that understands exit codes. Um, so yeah, help me, help me write this because I ran out of time to write it. Uh, but this is where, um, I, I think we need to be going. And I think that we need some sort of solution, uh, not to rival things like Percy, but that can be available as an alternative when people don't have the means or the uh, permissions <laughs> to use services like that. Um, here's some quick resources. That top one is an awesome list of um, different browsers, different projects out there, some tutorials. It's a good hodgepodge of everything. Um, the next talk is uh, from one of the founders of Percy. It's not the one he did at EmberConf, it's a different one. Um, and it does a really good job of explaining the problem and why it really is a hard problem. And even though it looks simple with all the cute little graphics, there's there's a lot to take into consideration. Um, the rest, uh, visualregressing.com, that's just got tons of articles. Everything else are just the tools that I showed you and my little repo. Um, so yeah. Uh, I, Thanks to Dr. Gare for letting me work on it. And thanks. Anybody have any questions or comments or want to sign up to help me write it? 
Sean. <laughs> but yeah, that's all I've got. <laughs> Any of your clients using uh, any kind of visual regression? Not the ones that I have worked on. Um, and partially because of the um, privacy concerns of going to services, um, which is really what set me off on looking at this. Um, but I mean, I was interested, but I was curious what there would be for them. Do you think this would be useful? <clears throat> Like the acceptance tests that you already write, just have yes. like a one line in there that says take the screenshot now. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, um, I did a, a proof of concept on Val Carrot's website for a while. We we managed we had four weeks of Percy somehow instead of two. Um so we put it on there and it was it was it was helpful. We did a we did a number upgrade. Um we did a couple uh more major features on there during that time. And it was nice to just have it as part of your existing test suite and not a separate thing to maintain. Like I'm very strongly believe that people will not maintain things that are separate. So <laughs> it has to be part of what's already in front of you. Like I say, but when you, well, I did notice that there was like a lack of ID in there. Is there anything that has ID? Well, I mean, you can, Backstop does not list it. There are some tools that specifically work with Trifle, um, but I don't recall off the top of my head which one they are. That awesome whatever thing at the top resource there um, has does have some listed. Uh, in the past, I've worked with things where we just did actual cross-browser like Selenium through browser labs. It, it was painful. Um, it was really painful. Those things are really brittle. Did you look at anything that integrated with Selenium or tools like that, like integrated Percy or any of these things into those? I didn't go for Selenium because I've had bad experience with Selenium in the past. Um, and I, and I, it seems like people are, there's kind of like a divergence. Like there's, there's some are going that route because they really want to have the, the multi, especially if your product, which I think I heard you say product earlier. Um, you, you want to have all the product things covered. Um, but they, they are, it's a significant, more significant investment. Most definitely. Like they seem easy. Cucumber seems super easy. Yeah. Um, and, and it is, it's not that bad to write if you organize things. But they do just randomly break and not work the way they're supposed to. In our case, we have an entire team of people in India <laughs> in our QA team. I think a couple of them, of them have joined the Hangout, but <clears throat> they maintain them uh, for us. So they know the pain. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I never got to have a team doing it for me. Because that's well, what you have nice, to do. Right? If I could just <laughs> Right. Yeah. Yeah. No. And, and, and I think those, I think there are some solutions that are more focused on that. Um, if I were, if I were starting a company like Percy, I would stay away from it because it's, it's less likely to bite me if I go with the, with the newer and the more, I mean, Selenium, a lot of the stuff under Selenium is so old um, and they just don't upgrade the underlying technologies. And so you're, you're, you're working with things that are supposed to work, um, but just don't. And you you don't want to change your software for your test sake. Like that's mm -hmm. to me one of the worst things you can do. Um, but you need to be able to test it, right? So you need it, you you need things to be able to go modern. Um, but when you the second you go to anything that's a little more in the last couple of years, <laughs> um, it, it can get really hard really fast. Have you tried dragging and dropping from one iframe to the next? <laughs> so one of the things that like occurred to me when I was watching this is like, I know PolyJS is something that came out of, I feel like Netflix or something, but yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, if you kind of combine that along with Percy, you've, I mean, you've got a pretty simple thing to like regression test your entire app, like you can record snapshots. So, um, 
I don't know. I'm excited. Thanks for. <laughs> yeah, no, and, and ideas are great. Um, I just I need to. The, I, I feel like it has to be something that doesn't come on with Percy. Like I said, I love Percy. It's great. It's awesome. It's super well, easy. The Percy but it's just... not not Percy per se, but like mm -hmm. if you could get backstop right, where it's as easy to okay, yeah. as Percy as an open source solution, that would be awesome too. Now, one of the things I was talking to people about is whether um, you really have to do like the Percy approach of pulling Dom aside for later in order to make it really. Um, something you can run quicker. Like I found the backstop stuff, stuff to run pretty quickly and it does run multiple tests in parallel and you can figure all of that. So um, it is better, better than your normal, like one at a time kind of test, but still it'd be even better if you could just totally off offload it. But those are explorations <laughs> beyond the cursory view. Can you like take the screenshots like outside of backstop feed it into the part where you're like approving things? Well, sure, if you just had them in um, named appropriately and in the test folder, because I mean, when it goes to do a comparison, it's just running against those two. Is I wonder, it, yeah. um, there's... Because I'm just spitballing here, right? Hmm. Like if we're testing our acceptance tests, I say sure, but maybe that's not like so easy. There should be. Right. It should be possible. Because <laughs> like if we're testing our acceptance tests in browsers, mostly it's in Chrome, but like if you're running a server to one of your tests, yeah, and you don't really need backstop to take the screenshots, you can have something that takes the screenshots and feed it into an approval process later on or something. Well, then you're kind of getting into that world of your own, right? Like I'm going to take yeah, the screenshots and put them somewhere, and then I'm going to grab this other because, tool that does diffing, and then I'm going to... Because like if you're feeding, if you want to use your acceptance tests, you're kind of running them twice, maybe? because well so what i one of the things i was thinking like if you used that um approach of just having like a percy snapshot test helper or whatever the visual or whatever test helper <laughs> um in either case you're throwing that in in the middle where you already have the page render right um or at least in the percy case you already have the page rendered and for them they're grabbing the dom to play with later um but you could be snapping something at that point uh it's there, it's rendered. You just need to grab it, right? Yeah. Um, and you could grab DOM and do like a, you know, get the generated CSS along with it and pull it aside and um, throw that up later, like Percy does. Yeah, don't you think like there's a possibility there, right? Like, <laughs> have you heard of anyone using? Um, you know, to make the approval process a little bit easier, like using machine learning to, you know, we're to, basically you train a model where certain types of variation is, is acceptable. Um, and then other types of variation are like. Hmm. Well, you know, what the, I haven't seen that. Um, what I do see is that a lot of these, including backstop, but not Percy, although they'll do it if you ask them, um, is that you can adjust how much variation is acceptable, mm -hmm. but that's like on a per run basis as opposed to a, a type of variation that is acceptable. And I mean, to some designers, no variation is acceptable, <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> so, you know, I don't have like picky, you have to have like different models trained for different <laughs> clients yeah, or something. <laughs> categorize a button. And a button <laughs> Like your fonts can be a little off, or can they? <laughs> no. Is any of this stuff used at Netflix for anyone that, or any other like mega company? Uh, I know more? that we've talked about it for them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure companies use it, yeah. <laughs> Other companies I've been at weren't okay with the privacy requirement, but did um, approach them on the side about doing something anyway where they would host it. And I, I think if you're big enough, that maybe there's a possibility there, but they were pretty big. I've seen people use a person, but I haven't seen any custom stuff. Yeah. Probably because it takes work. <laughs> But it's 
work we can all share. Yeah. <laughs> so we should all do it together. <laughs> I feel like it hasn't been nailed yet. It's just no, no, exactly. That's that's what I was, that was kind of the point, right? Like here's this is gone, this is gone, this is gone, this is gone. <laughs> There's a lot of challenges. I can see like QA, a QA team would love something like this mm -hmm. because they could run it, run the app as a black box now. For an engineer running these tests, I want them to be fast and not flaky. I want to be fast, not flaky, but it's it's kind of also like for UX people. I mean, think that how much work are UX people putting this stuff, right? They don't have any way to test the stuff they do. Um, they really have to rely on uh, either classes existing or not existing and uh, manual QA people. Um, and they don't have that same peace of mind that we have when we write code. But some of their stuff is just as intricate and and arguably scarier to change. Like I had the you know Homer Simpson slide CSS slide in there, but I took it out because it didn't need to be there. But it, it it's my favorite slide. <laughs> <laughs> but they don't they don't have that, and they, so they're the ones that were screaming for it first. Um, but like you know, like I said, you can catch other stuff. It's just and and it also kind of lets you QA people be QA people instead of like machines going through scripts, you know, like they shouldn't have to do that. They should be out there doing edge cases and weird stuff and dividing by zero or whatever it is they do. Um, For the, um, the abandoned ones that were out there, did you look at them closely enough to maybe get an indication of why they were abandoned? Like problems Most, too hard or does nobody care? The ember ones or, or the not ember ones? Any, any of them really? I think the, the yeah. non number ones were mostly because it would be like the new shiny. Um, some new diffing tool came out, so someone wrote it. Um, you know, headless chrome, headless chrome. Oh my gosh, headless chrome. Um, look at all these things we can do. Yeah. Yeah. I think there was a lot of that. Um, and so they were mostly just new shiny kind of things. But with the amber ones, I think they they stuck with it a little bit and then didn't get any return or didn't. It just got stuck. Um, and and digging into the internals in Ember where you're getting into where the tests run and, and start doing that, like they don't, it's not always apparent where you need to do things, um, which is kind of why I went for the hacky naive approaches at first of saying, I don't really want to get into that. Can't I just do it from the configuration side? Um, but really, I think that you, you do have to get into it. Broccoli and nobody knows it, so I hate broccoli. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, I mean, it, it you might, I think you can get away with it without changing things in broccoli, honestly. <laughs> I mean, the ever person, yeah, it doesn't change anything in broccoli, it doesn't, they don't have a custom broccoli yeah. library, so it can be done. And yeah, what I've known of broccoli, I've forgotten. So every time I use it, I, every time I write something in it, like I get it and I work really hard to get it and then I forget it. The whole just... point of Ember, or at least like a big part of it is you don't have to hack your build. Right, um, yeah. So you do it so infrequently that it can't move into long-term memory. Yeah. Like, it so it's because Ember is so good that I can't remember yeah. broccoli. Yeah. That's, that's good. People that have crappy build frameworks, they're really good at those builds. <laughs> I'm going to stop the recording. Yes, here, thank and you. And then we can get real crazy. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Have you started a project?